Okay, give me liberty or give me death. We've heard this phrase a lot, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the secular world and everything. And the whole point of me doing this study is, um, first let's start at 2 Corinthians 5.10. So go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 5.10. I am a King James Bible believer. Make sure you have your King James Bible with you and opened. This is gonna, we're gonna try to go through these quick because there's a lot of them. And we're gonna be turning because I want to turn with you. You know, when I'm standing up, <laughs> it's hard for me to turn, so I just read the clipboard. But when I'm sitting down, I like to turn with you to Scripture. So 2 Corinthians 5:10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. All right, there's the word conscience. You'll see as we do this study on liberty, um, there's going to be certain words that are going to be going through a lot. You're going to see liberty a lot. You're going to see conscience a lot. Okay? Now, the reason I read that, the first part I read it because um, if you watched my video on the three manifestations of the Lord, of the glory of the Lord, one of the things I believe is when we stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, our works are going to be thrown before the throne, before Jesus Christ. And everything that gave him glory okay, uh, is going to remain. Things that didn't give him, that didn't give him glory is going to get burnt up. One of the manifestations of the glory of the Lord is fire. One is uh, clouds, you read in the Old Testament. And um, one is um, light. We're the light of the world because Jesus is in us. Jesus is the light of the world, but we're to shine to the world because Jesus is in us. All right? God's glory. Um, so I believe the works that we do, if they don't glorify God, they're going to be burnt up. And that's the dividing factor between what doesn't get burnt up and what does get burnt up? Can you give God glory in it? Okay. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 uh, If you want to turn there, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to turn there, but if you want to turn there, I've said this before in other studies, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We're to give God thanks in all things. That's a command. Colossians 3.17 And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So the best three things you can do, brothers and sisters in Christ, to define those works that we're talking about, what's going to get burnt up and what doesn't, can you give God glory in it? Part of giving God glory, as we're going to read in this study, is obeying God's commands. Okay, that gives God glory. That's how you glorify God, by obeying His commands. Um, can you give God thanks in it? That's another question to ask yourself. Um, and I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but we're still going to keep going through this. Um, can you give God, uh, can you do it in the name of Jesus Christ? Okay. So that's what this whole study is. In the second part I read there, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, we're going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be a great thing, and it's going to be a thing that's terror. What are you talking about? We're going to see our works get burnt up that didn't glorify God. Now, I don't know how it's going to work. We'll find out when we get there. Is everything that we did that didn't glorify God going to be shown to everybody? Even if it's just between you and Jesus, Jesus is still there, and the terror of all that stuff you did that didn't glorify God, you didn't give God thanks in, Having the terror of having to face Jesus Christ when it comes to that part, the stuff that gets burnt up. It's very serious what you do in this life as a Christian. It's not just we're not just looking for the blessed hope as far as like I always say, looking up in the sky, going, "Is today the day, Lord? Are you coming?" Uh, looking for the coming of the Lord, the blessed hope, means that you're doing your best to live a life of Christ right now, today, every day. Okay. That everything you do glorifies God. Everything you do, you can give God thanks in it. Everything you do, you can do it in the name of Jesus Christ. So that terror is there. Okay. So the main point of the study is to correct some of the brethren when they, because they're misusing liberty. 
Okay? They're using liberty as justification for sin. They're using liberty as a justification for doing something that you can't give God glory in, you can't give God thanks in, and you can't give uh, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, people would always tell me, well, it's not a sin issue. It's not a sin issue necessarily. But in my studies and looking into it, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're commanded to do something by the Lord and you don't do it, what's that called? Sin. You know what the laws are? The laws are a commandment given to us by God. God commands us not to do this. God commands us to do this. It's a command. That's why you have the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments we have is uh, Second Timothy 2.15. I hope I have the right address. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a command. Oh, no, no, we have liberty. If you want to study, that's fine. If you don't want to study, that's okay. And, you know, you don't even have to rightly divide if you don't want to. Is that what liberty's talking about? No, that's a command. You give God glory when you study the Word of God and you rightly divide. You're obeying God's command, giving Him glory by doing what He tells you to do. All right. So there's commands that if you don't abide by them, you're going to fall into sin. How do you fall into sin with the 2 Timothy 2.15? Uh, you start making a mess of the Bible. Start teaching heresies, falsehoods, messing up teachings, causing brethren to stumble and fall. All right. Steering a brethren in the wrong direction. So those are commands. All right. One of the biggest things that they'll try to use for liberty is, and I'm using this as an example, um, I have a red shirt, you have a blue shirt. I want to wear red shirts only, you want to wear blue shirts only. This person over here wants to wear all the any color, color shirts he wants. We have liberty. Is that what liberty is talking about in the Bible? Right? You know how the world is. They like to take words, they like to add their own definitions to try to confuse things, to mess things up. So words have meaning, but are those meanings the definition of that word backed by Scripture? This isn't a big thing where I have to go off and do all these designs. Or no. We just stick with the Bible. What does liberty mean in the Bible? It means several different things, as we're going to read. Okay. Um, so Acts 26.32. Acts 26.32. This is Paul. He's been arrested, and he's gone to King Agrippa and Festus, okay? And then at one point before this, he appeals to Caesar, okay? So, 32, then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So, what's the context of liberty here? Leave, one of the definitions in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, leave, permission granted, the witness obtained liberty to leave the court. Now, I understand he's not a witness, but he'd been set at liberty. He'd been let go. You're, you're free to go if he hadn't appealed into Caesar. So the context of here, of liberty is being set free from that court that was going on. All right. Acts 24, 23. Go back to 24, 23. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come unto him. Now, liberty there, is it talking about he was set free and he was free to go? No. Uh, Acts 27.3. Jump over to Acts 27.3. I'm not trying to be me. I'm just trying to make the point that not everything has, not a word has multiple definitions. It doesn't always have one uniform translation, one definition. It means the same thing every time it's used. I'm trying to be open with you, brother, sister, Christ, and show you all the different ways it's used in the Bible in the New Testament. We're just going over New Testament. All right? Um, Acts 27, 3. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. 
Now, what's liberty within these two verses that we read? Paul is free to do something, but there's a boundary to what he's allowed to do. Is he being set free? You're free to go, liberty. Like the first definition we read about Festus, he would have been sought at liberty if he had not appealed into Caesar. I'm paraphrasing. Is it the same thing? No. There's a boundary to his liberty right now. Okay? Now, this definition of liberty, I believe, in Webster's 1820 Dictionary, a space in which one is permitted to pass without restraint, okay, and beyond which he may not lawfully pass, a boundary, okay, uh, with a plural as the liberties of a prison. He was a prisoner, okay? So that definition is he had liberty, but the liberty was defined by a boundary, and that boundary is to go unto his friends to refresh himself. That was the boundary of that liberty that's being talked about right here. Okay. So there's a second definition we learned about liberty. Okay. 1 Corinthians 7.39. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7.39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Okay. There's a lot of things to get from there. I've always taught that death isn't divorce, and it isn't. People will say, well, if a husband dies or a wife dies, that's divorce. The Bible doesn't teach that. Okay. The Sadducees tried to trip Jesus up with that. This woman was married to this man, then they died. Then the next brother, the next brother, and he, she was married to six men, six or seven men. And he said, whose wife is she in the resurrection? Now, Jesus, did he come back and say, and this is kind of off on a tangent a little bit, but did he come back and say, you, you do err because she's only married to the last person. The other ones that died, that's a divorce. She's only married to the last person. Is that what Jesus said? No. He said, you do err not knowing the faith, uh, the I'm paraphrasing. They are uh, they're neither given, taken or given in marriage, but as the angels in heaven. Okay? In other words, she was married to all of them, but he wasn't going to let them slip them up because whereas the angels in heaven, there is no marriage after the resurrection. Okay? Whereas the angels in heaven. But for this study, um, if her husband be dead, she is at liberty. She's not divorced. She's at liberty. What does liberty mean in this context? Okay. Freedom from restraint in a general sense and applicable to the body or to the will or to the mind. The body is at liberty when not confined. The mind or the will or mind is at liberty when not checked or controlled. It's talking about the body. When you get married, you're one flesh. When your husband dies or your wife dies, you're set at liberty. You're free from that other body. You're no longer one flesh. People say, well, that's a divorce. It doesn't say divorce. It says liberty. Okay? Because she can remain a widow and remain, they say unmarried, but married to that first man. Okay? Or she has liberty now to be remarried. But whether you disagree with me on that or not, about death being divorced or not, not to try to change, like to stray from the point of this, but the point of this liberty is that she's free from the husband that died. And now she's at liberty because of, that, of, of his death, she has liberty. And that's important to understand. Uh, when we get on to this, talking about salvation, we have liberty now. Why? Because of the death of someone very important. Okay? Her husband died. That's the liberty now. She's at liberty to be married to another. All right. So we have that definition. Physical, uh, free from restraints. Okay. When you're married, you're one flesh. You can't get married to another. That's fornication. All right. That's adultery. When your husband dies, now you're at liberty. Romans 8.21. I'm going to turn to Romans 8.21. Right. 
8. I was at the wrong spot there for a second. I was like, that's not right. Okay, Romans 8, 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. Notice the word bondage there. Okay. For we know that the whole cre creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but also... So, not only they, but ourselves also. Okay, he's talking about the whole world. Not only they, but of ourselves, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We that are saved. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Okay. Uh, if you turn over to, just go back to verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The liberty that's talked about here is salvation. Remember the study I did on um, in Christ Jesus. Okay? And it's talking about how the soul is no longer connected to the body. The liberty that's talking about salvation is the soul is no longer connected to the body. Okay. God, someone died. Remember we talked about that? Jesus died, so then we are set at liberty. And what's that liberty? Our flesh is no longer in charge. Okay. We can choose to give in to the flesh and fall into sin. Not that we have the right to sin, but I'm saying the liberty before, you didn't have liberty. And we're going to talk about this. The liberty, the reason I name this, give me liberty or give me death, is because when we get through this study, it's exactly what it is. Either you have liberty, or you are under the law of sin and death. Okay. Um, two, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Here we are, we're getting into it now. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All these studies we've been doing, okay? The liberty there. We've been set free from the law of sin and death. We're now under the law of God. Another part of the passage, I can't remember if it's 7 or 8, further on in 8, talks about the law of God, but what we just read there, the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? So one of the definitions of liberty as we're getting in here is it's talking about salvation. And we're going to start getting into the meat of this, okay? When you're under the law of sin and death, you have no liberty. You obey the law, and you're under the law of sin and death. You sin so much as once, you're going to hell. There is no liberty, okay? The Old Testament laws and ordinance is a great example. Okay, Galatians 3.24 Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. When God saves you, you are created in Christ Jesus. You are now under the law of God, the law of the Spirit of life. What's the law of the Spirit of life in? We just read it. It's in Christ Jesus. Now, there is liberty when you are under the law of God. And we're going to get into that liberty. Okay? You are saved now. You're under liberty. What's the liberty? The boundary of that liberty. Right? Uh, some questions to ask yourself to see if liberty applies to you. We went over this at the beginning, but we'll go over it again. Can you give God glory in what you are doing? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Can you give God glory in what you're doing? When you're trying to say it's liberty, it's liberty. Because like I said, people are trying to grab it and say, just to use liberty to hide behind to justify sin. They use liberty to hide behind to try to justify not giving God glory in something, doing something that doesn't give God glory, doing something that you can't give God thanks in, doing something, and I'm kind of going through here because the second one is, can you give God thanks in what you're doing, 1 Thessalonians 5.18? Can you give God thanks in what you're doing? Can you do what you're doing in the name of Jesus Christ? We read that in Colossians 3.18. Is what you are doing worshiping the Lord Jesus or mankind in the flesh? Let that one kind of sink in a little bit because we're going to get to that. Okay? Are you worshiping God through what you're doing? Or are you worshiping the flesh or a false god, mankind? All three, all the above. Okay? Now, we're going to get in here. Liberty has to do with the Old Testament laws. 
That's what liberty is talking about in the next few passages that we're reading. Because people like to grab it and say, we have liberty today. I can do, we have the right to choose. And they try to use things that doesn't apply to what the Bible says. Right? So, three things that can happen, though, when you're using liberty properly. Okay? Or some properly, some not properly. Liberty, your liberty can offend people. It can. But there's two types of offenses that we're going to read. There's offending where someone's trying to control you, bring you back under bondage. And there's their offend when it comes to conscience. Your conscience comes into play and is, are you going too crazy with your liberty that you're offending people and brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, your conscience can often can offend liberty. And that goes to the other part that I was talking about. Your conscience can offend liberty. Your liberty can offend people. Okay? Um, and then your conscience can offend liberty. In other words, your conscience is saying, hey, even though I have liberty, I shouldn't be doing this. Okay. The flesh can try to hide behind liberty. And we're going to see this too. So those are three things that just to think about and focus on as we're reading through these. Those questions to ask whether liberty applies or not. If you want to know if liberty applies, the best rule of thumb as we're going to read through these. God, I love Paul. He'll say this is an example, but here's the rule of thumb across the board. Here's the rule, general rule across the board. It's because you can, some people can get stuck on one example and just be stuck on that one example. And Paul's like, but here's the general rule. Obey this, and you won't have to f worry about falling into the trap of whatever the example is. Mm -hmm. So 1 Corinthians 10.25. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, as you turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 25, um, I want to read another definition real quick. But i got to turn there too. 1 Corinthians 10, 25. No. Yep, 10, 25. Because I skipped the part of Liberty 5. Religious liberty is the freedom. Uh, that's the fifth definition in the Webster's 1820 Dictionary. Religious liberty is the free right of adopting and enjoying opinions on religious subjects. Religious subjects. Okay. And of worshiping the supreme being according to the dictates of conscience. There's the word conscience. Without external control. We're going to get in this when we get into Galatians. How they're trying to bring them back under control. They're trying to control them by telling them they have to keep the law. Right. Dictates of conscience. Okay, your conscience will tell you, according to scripture, it's going to give you examples where your conscience is going to say, I know I have liberty, I know I can do this, but I'm not going to do it. Because of such, because my conscience says I'm going to be hurting somebody. All right. So I wanted to read that, and that's why we went through all those questions. Okay. Uh, notice it says opinions, not agree to disagree. Okay. Nowhere in the Bible will you find agree to disagree. Okay. You can have opinions in the sense of, I want to follow this law. Another person can come along and say, well, my opinion is I, I don't want to follow the law. I just, don't, I just don't feel like we need to follow that law. You can have opinions, but nowhere in the Bible does it say we're to agree to disagree. Okay. The Bible says time and time again, we're to be of one mind, one mind. Okay. We're to be together, not separate. Okay. Now, what religious system do we know out there that controls and dictates? <laughs> like I said, dictates of conscience and, and without external control. Who goes against that? Some of the big main religions I can throw out there. The first one is Catholic Church, the Catholicism. They try to control people okay, by uh, external control. They go outside the Word of God. Traditions of men, that's what the church says. If it goes against scripture, you're to obey the church. Okay? And they're the ones that dictate conscience. Uh, another one would be Jehovah's Witness, Mormons. Um, I almost want to say Muslims too. Okay? But those are good examples of people that are dictating what your conscience is supposed to be. They're trying to tell you, you know, what you're to do and what you're not to do. And you have to do that to be saved. 
because that I jumped ahead a little bit, but that's what it's all about. Liberty, as we get through here, it's talking about you have to keep the law in order to be saved. Because in the Old Testament, you had to. But in the New Testament, because we're no longer under the law of sin and death, we're under the law of God, we now have liberty. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 10, 25. And we're going to read all the way down to 31. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, and asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Right? Not to ask questions, but what's the question they're talking about you? Verse 28, But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. Now you know. Before you were ignorant. You sat down, you, get, you can get invited. Uh, I have family members that are lost. You get invited to a lost person's home to eat. And you sit there and eat it. There's nothing wrong. Okay? But now you get told that food was offered unto idols. What do you do now? You don't eat it. For that person's sake, because you're supposed to be an example for that, and not only to the lost world, but to the brethren, for that person's sake, you don't eat it, and for conscience' sake. Because mm -hmm. now you're, you're held accountable once you know that it's offered unto idols. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Notice it says it twice. Because liberty says we can eat whatever we want as long as we give God, and I'm jumping ahead, God thanks for it. But there are certain situations where you don't eat it. Whether you have liberty or not, you don't do it. 29. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? There's the word liberty. And people like to grab this verse and say, see, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? And then they apply that liberty to something that doesn't even apply to liberty. Okay? Recently, um, the biggest thing, and I'll bring it out again, was video games. People were using this verse to justify video games. And we're going to keep reading and realize it has nothing to do with video games. Where in the Old Testament law are we commanded to play video games or we're commanded not to play video games? That's what the liberty is talking about. And we're going to find that out. They like to read that part, brothers and sisters in Christ, and they don't keep going. Let us keep going. Verse 30. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? There's the thanks. Remember that part. 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Let that sink in, brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember what Paul does. He gives us an example. What's the example he's given us? Well, if you want to turn over to Leviticus 11.1, 1, I'm going to stay here. But, uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall not, ye shall eat among all the beasts. I said, I said it wrong. These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but defieth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but defieth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but defieth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divideth the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean unto you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch, they are unclean to you. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's the Old Testament law when it comes to meats. We saw the word thanks there. Mm -hmm. Turn to 1 Timothy 4.3. We'll just go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 4.3. Mm -hmm. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats 
which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused of if it be received with thanksgiving. Remember what we read over here about why is my uh, liberty judged of another man's conscience? For that which I give thanks. But no, why am I, for, for if I'm a great, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? What's it talking about? Meats. Okay, because we're reading that here. Uh, verse 5, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. I give thanks for the food I'm eating. I give God the thanks. We're going to find out later on that there's people that ways where you're not giving God thanks for the food you're eating. But he's talking about if it's not offered unto idols, why is my conscience being judged of another? Why is my liberty being judged of another man's conscience? And it's talking about meats. Okay? It's there. Then when we get to verse 31, he just flat out says, Whatsoever ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. He gives the general rule. For this subject, it's talking about food. The Old Testament law says there's only certain meats you can eat. There are certain things you're not allowed to eat. You'll become defiled. Why? Because your soul and your spirit are connected. Okay? When it comes to the word defiled. New Testament, our soul's not connected to our flesh and God has sanctified all the, the meats now. We can eat anything as long as we're giving God thanks for it, prayer and thanks, and that cleans that meat, and we can eat it. But now as we read there, you give, if you find out it's offered unto idols, are you to eat it? No, because it's no longer giving God thanks and prayer, and it's not sanctified by thanks and prayer, because you know it's offered unto idols. But right there again, when they try to use that liberty to justify things that you can't give God glory in, what does it just say there? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Paul's just saying, okay, you have liberty to eat whatever you want, food-wise. Okay? And people are coming in trying to take that liberty, trying to pull you back under the old law. They're trying to get you to eat food offered unto idols. But listen, people can take it too far and say, I can just eat whatever I want whenever I want. It's saying, whatever you do, make sure you're giving God glory in it. Can you give God glory in food offered unto idols? No. And I don't want to jump ahead, but there's other things you can do when you're eating food that you have liberty that doesn't give God glory, even though you have liberty. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, conscience here is about what things you choose to do that worship the Lord. Okay. Hear me out. Give God glory, thanks, in the name of Jesus. All three of those things that we talked about. You can't give God glory um, if you're saying you have to eat only certain types of food. If you're liberty, if you don't have liberty and you're being brought back into the Old Testament law, you have to eat this food, or you can't eat that food, or you're lost, or you can lose your salvation. Right? Remember what liberty is. Right? So liberty is where it becomes a salvation issue. Why is my liberty judged? of another man's conscience, the word judge. And this example, it's meat. You gave God glory for obeying the Old Testament law. Remember, when you obey the law, a command from God is, is a law. Right? You were giving God glory for the food that He did allow you to eat. He provided it. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Now we can give God glory and thanks in any meat. Old Testament, you have to do this or you're lost. Works to be saved. A lot of the Old Testament laws are done today to worship God, not to be saved. That's what the word liberty means. You're at liberty because you no longer have to do them to be saved. Uh -huh. And again, I love how Paul gives the example. Talking about meats, someone telling you you can't eat this certain meat. And like I said, you can't eat it if it's offered unto idols. But if it's not offered unto idols, false idols, then you're, you're free to eat it. Why is your liberty judged of another man's conscience? But the context there, it's talking about food, the law, the Old Testament law. But Paul says, you know what, across the board, if you think, if anybody tries to get you to doubt, you know, when it comes to liberty, here's a rule of thumb. Can you give God glory in it? Yes. Then it might apply to liberty. Like I said, it should apply to liberty when it comes to the Old Testament law. Are you doing it to give God glory? 
Yes. Then it's liberty. Right? Are you doing it to be saved? Have good works to be saved? Then it's no longer liberty. Remember, give me liberty or give me death. The law of sin and death. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8.1. Let's go to the next one. Another one that they like to use. Or actually, this isn't the one that they like to use. This is the one that I had to learn. Um, so 1 Corinthians 8.1, we're going to read down through it. Now, as touching things offered unto idols. Here we go back to the idols again. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Okay. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Okay. There's a, another passage that defeats the Trinity. Okay. There's only one capital G, God. For though there be that are called gods, plural, like the gods, plural, of the Trinity, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one capital G God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in him, and one capital L Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. Real quick, I believe in the Godhead. Someone's news watching this. I believe in the Godhead of the King James Bible. I reject the Trinity, the pagan Trinity of the Catholic Church. I have videos on it, and um, brothers out, out there in Christ have good videos on it too. I'm not going to go into it. I just had to throw that in there because it's just right in your face. You can't fight this, but the Trinity people still do. Verse 7, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol, we just read about this earlier, if you know that it's, it's offered unto idols, Unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Mm -hmm. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Remember the liberty. You can eat whatever meat you want. Right? But it changes when it's offered unto idols. And notice how when you eat food offered unto idols and you know it, your conscience becomes weak and can become defiled. Verse 9, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. See how far we were supposed to go. Okay. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in an idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered unto idols? He's doing it. Maybe it's not so bad. Right? Verse 11, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That's how we know it's talking about meat. Meat's offered unto idols. Because it says right there, Wherefore, if meat make my brother offend. Okay. So, now, we're, we read there, the liberty it's talking about here is meats. Right? Now, when you eat meats offered unto idols, are you giving God glory or the idols? Something to think about. The answer is, you're giving God, the idols glory, not God, if you're eating meat offered unto idols. Are you giving God thanks, capital G God thanks, or lowercase g God thanks, when you're eating food offered unto idols? Lowercase g God. Okay. Remember we read about whose glory is in their shame and whose God is their belly? Well, I don't care. I'm just going to eat it. It's no big deal. Okay. Are you causing brethren to eat meats offered unto idols? Are you causing brethren to stumble because you have liberty to eat whatever meat you want, but when you find out that it's offered unto idols, are you causing the brethren to stumble and do the same thing? Okay. Now, a good example of, um, says, now are you using liberty and closing doors to witnessing? Did you know that your liberty can be, you have the liberty, but your liberty can close doors 
to witnessings that would have been open if you hadn't been so, I have liberty, I have liberty. In other words, your conscience, you put your conscience to the side and go, I have liberty, I can do whatever I want. I can eat any meat that I want. Okay? Um, uh, restaurants. I, I said this before, I think, to some of the brethren. I don't know if I ever came out on video and said this before. But restaurants, there's some restaurants I can't eat at them anymore and I hardly eat out anymore. is because God's really convicted me. Chinese restaurants, Japanese restaurants, you go in there, there's false idols. I mean, one place had a Buddha where you go to pay for your food. I mean, right next to where you pay for your food, there's a Buddha. People are rubbing the stomach. They put the money around it for blessings from their God, lowercase g, God. And you go in there, you eat the food, and you pay next to their God, and you're eating food offered unto idols. And I get to the point where I just don't go out to eat hardly at all anymore. I'll grab, like I said before in another study, I'll openly say it. I grab a Subway sandwich every so often. I'll go to the beach, drop off some gospel tracts places, hand out a few gospel tracts, run some errands. And when I come home on a beach, what I call a beach day, I'll grab a sub sandwich on the way home. Okay? Um, but for the most part, uh, I used to go to this pizza place, but now I've been convicted about that pizza place because they serve alcohol and We'll get into that part here in a second. But they serve alcohol, but they have all these alcohol signs. And I was sitting in there once, and it had, like, secular music. And I just got to the point where um, I just don't go there. Not for this reason, but I just don't go there because even though I have liberty to eat, I just there's people, brings it into the next part, that struggle with alcohol. And if a brother sees me go in there, then he's going to go, well, maybe it's not that big. And this brother in Christ that goes in there struggles with alcohol. And there's all these signs that's right in your face. Budweiser, this, that, and everything. And, yeah, it's just being convicted. But the liberty part, okay, the liberty part where it can be abused is what does Paul say in verse 13? Wherefore, because it says, when you sin so against the brethren... And wound their weak conscience, he sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no meat while the world standeth. Meat make my brother offend. Okay? One of the things people will grab uh, liberty when we had the video game issue was they kept grabbing alcohol, trying to say alcohol is the same thing as, as um, video games. And it's not. Okay? Can you give God glory with uh, wine, a glass of wine? Yeah. Your stomach's hurt, you drink a glass of wine, it makes your stomach stop hurting. You can give God glory for that. You can't give God glory for video games. Okay? You can't give God glory for the Hollywood movies and TV shows. Okay? But let's talk about wine as it applies to this. The law states that you're not to get drunk. It's a command. That's a law. You do not get drunk. Okay? But you're allowed to have a glass of wine for your infirmities. Now, why do I not touch them? I don't touch alcohol, period. I have liberty. I can have a glass of wine, but why do I not drink, period? There's herbs. There's other things you can do to help with your stomach. You don't have to have a glass of wine. Is it wrong? Am I telling you you're not allowed to? No. I'm telling you why I don't have anything to do with it. Because of what that said right there, verse 13, 12 and 13. There are so many brothers and sisters in Christ out there, especially in the last days. I mean, how many of you brothers and sisters in Christ have struggled with alcohol? You were an alcoholic in your lost life. You're newly saved and still struggling with it. The key is struggling with it, not justifying it. Struggling with it. And some of you, God has overcome that in your life, but it's always a struggle in your heart and in your head till the day you die. How many of you do? I've come across a lot. So you know what? I'm not going to have anything to do with alcohol. Why? Because I don't want to sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience. Okay. I don't, uh, it says right there, I always try to, not that I'm adding to it, but just think of this. Wherefore, if meat make my brother offend, let's use the analogy that I'm using. Wherefore, if wine make my brother to offend, I will drink no wine while the world standeth. Okay. That's what it's talking about here. I have liberty. I can drink a glass of wine. I have liberty. But can your liberty, your conscience says, wait a minute, there's a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ out there who struggle with it. I don't want to put a stumbling block in front of them, and I don't want to tempt them, so I'm not going to have any alcohol. And if it gets that bad among the brethren, I'm not going to drink alcohol, period. 
Because notice here, one of the biggest things here is, does it say Paul's not going to eat meat around that brother in Christ? No, he says, uh, Wherefore, if meat make my brother singular to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. That's why I don't mess with alcohol. Okay? I don't want to offend any of the brothers and sisters in Christ. Tempt them. Get them to fall back into sin. Okay? So, as we see there, mm -hmm. liberty then is still talking about meats. It also gives us an example of, he's saying here, it can offend. Your liberty can offend a brother in Christ. It can cause them to stumble and to fall. So you got to be careful jumping up and saying, we have liberty, we have liberty. Your conscience comes into play. The liberty that's talking about here is Old Testament law. Right? Now we have liberty whether we want to follow it or we don't want to follow it. Now can your liberty offend somebody? Somebody who has a problem with it? Yeah. It can offend them and tempt them into falling back into having problems. 2 Corinthians 3.1 Go to 2 Corinthians 3.1. A lot of this is in Corinthians. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Okay. This is going to be a long one. We're going to read all the way down to 18. The whole chapter. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we at some other epistle of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, what was written in tables of stone in the Old Testament, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we now and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. If you haven't got it, we're kind of leaning into it. Law of sin and death versus the law of, of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stone was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. There's the word glory again. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in, the, in this respect, by reason of the glory that exalt excelleth. Remember, it goes back to what we were saying. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The glory of the law is to point you to Jesus Christ. You can't keep it. You're on your way to hell, and there's nothing you can do, you can do, to get out of hell. For if that which was done away with glorious, much more than that which remained is glorious. Verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. It's not difficult. The gospel is not difficult. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. They still try to stay under the Levitical laws. They still try to do good works to be saved. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's our word liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed in same, into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now a little bit of a sidetrack thing, where it says glass, the glory of the Lord. Today we can make glass, it's so clear, it's almost like it's not even there. Back then when this was written, no. Right. 
the head glass you can see through somewhat. But I believe here, a good instruction of righteousness to think about in the heart, brothers and sisters of Christ, is we think we understand the glory of the Lord now. Wait till we get to the judgment seat of Christ. Wait till we get to heaven. Wait till we get to eternity. We, we will definitely see what the real, true, full force of the glory of God is. Okay? And what it can do. So, um, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six: The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. What's going on in the liberty it's talking about? Uh, we're saved from the law of sin and death. We have liberty now. We can choose to obey certain of the Old Testament laws or not. A lot of the Old Testament laws had to do with sacrificing of animals. We're set free from that. We don't do that today. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. And there's other laws that have nothing to do with uh, blood sacrifice, blood atonement, um, that we can choose to follow or not follow. We're not held captive under that anymore. Romans 8.2 which we read, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of the sin of sin and death. Okay? It's Old Testament law versus the law of God. And notice the glory of the Lord is there. We talked about that. You cannot keep the Old Testament law to be saved. You need Jesus Christ. Now, liberty is not talking about now we can sin all we want. We're going to get to that here up in another part of where it uses liberty. It is talking about Old Testament laws, do's and some don'ts. Traditions of men come in and pervert this too. Just want to throw that in there. They come in and pervert this in the Old Testament law. They try to bring you back under it. But the liberty you're set free from is the blood atonement. You don't have to do that anymore because Jesus paid it all. The liberty is if you don't keep all the laws, you're not going to hell. You have to keep every single law or you go to hell. Okay, That's the liberty there. Galatians 2.1. Let's go to Galatians 2.1. Then, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem and Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run and had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Hmm. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Okay. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay. That's supposed to be our attitude. Someone comes to you and says, you have to do this to be saved. Oh yeah, well... You know, repentance, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Yeah, that's there and, and you need to do that, but you also need to do this. And they start grabbing Old Testament law, uh, traditions of men, works to be saved. You don't have to give them any time. Get out of here. Get away from me. Wolf in sheep's clothing. Get out of here. Okay. But we see there, what's the liberty it's talking about? Is it talking about something that, that you can't give God glory in? Can't give Him thanks in? You can't do it in the name of Jesus Christ? No. The liberty it's talking about is the law of sin and death, the Old Testament laws, the ordinances. Okay. If He wants to get uh, circumcised, it's written. You're supposed to be circumcised the eighth day. And we're going to read this real quick. Genesis, I'm not going to turn there, but Genesis 17.10, because there's a lot to this when it comes to circumcision. This is my covenant which she shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a token of the covenant between, betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generation. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house, and he that is brought, bought with the money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that so shall be cut off from his people. 
He hath broken my covenant. Is that how it works today? It was the command for the Old Testament. The Jewish people are God's chosen people, and they still are. But they were God's people. That's who he focused on in the Old Testament. Who's God's people today? What we call the church age. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To the catching away of the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Kind of gave that away. The body of Christ. The church. Okay. So, if he does, is, does, is he commanded to be circumcised? Well, no. Because if you look into it, we are circum spiritual circumcision today. Our soul is circumcised from our body so it's cut we're no longer attached what we do physically no longer affects our soul right now we're not going to keep sinning that uh we're going to get to that we're not supposed to sin that grace may abound but that's the liberty we have now okay he has a choice now remember we talked about early about liberty how liberty sometimes can be your conscience can say i know i have liberty but i need to do something I know I have liberty, but I'm not going to do this. Okay, here's a great example of this same subject. You have, who is it? Um, Titus doesn't want to get circumcised. That's okay, but turn back to Acts 16:1. Turn back to Acts 16:1. Then came he to Derbe, Derbe, I don't know if I'm spelling that, pronouncing that right, and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which a, was a Jewish, was Jewish, a Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by, reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him. Who was Paul preaching to at that time? Let's keep reading. And took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Mm -hmm. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So wait, wait, I, don't, I do get it, but I'm just saying this to make a point. Is this a contradiction? Paul's saying, uh, Timotheus, you have to be circumcised to go with me. I'm going to preach to the Jews Jesus Christ. You want to come with me? You got to be circumcised. Yeah. Okay. He has liberty. He doesn't have to. But to win the Jews to Christ, he chose to get, he still has a choice, but he chose to get circumcised so he could go with Paul and preach the gospel. Another example, um, food. If I'm going to witness to the Jewish people, I have liberty. I can eat any meats I want. But let's say I have a Jewish family over. I'm making dinner for them. Am I going to get a huge pork steak or whatever, or big, like in the old days where you had the full-on pork with the mouth and everything, and just set it before them? Okay, let's eat. Uh, that door's going to close. Okay. I just now put a stumbling block between me and those Jewish people to preach the gospel to them. I have liberty. I can eat that pork all I want. But now I've offended them. Okay? There's times where liberty is going to offend people. Okay? And it's your fault. There's times where liberty is going to offend people because those people that it offends, best way to say it, the people that liberty offends is people who want to control you. This, you have to do this to be saved. You have to do this to be saved. You're not a Christian if you don't do this, this, and this. And it's talking about works, doing works. Okay? That's who you're going to offend with your liberty. That's a good thing. We have liberty. It's not by works. It's by God's grace. Okay? But the bad way that your liberty is going to offend people is when you try to put yourself, your conscience, you're not doing it for conscience sake. You're doing it for yourself. I want to eat it, I don't care. And you're not thinking of who's present with you. All right. So, uh, Galatians 5.1, if you want to turn to Galatians 5.1. So we see there evidence that liberty has to do with you have liberty or you give me death, the law of sin and death. All right. Either you're under the Old Testament law 
Because a lot of these people that like to misuse liberty, it's almost like they're saying, give me death. Give me the law of sin and death. Okay? Be careful that you're not misusing liberty. All right. Galatians 5.1 Therefore, being... No, I'm in Romans. I'm sorry. I was thinking Romans. I was reading here. That's why I type it up here too in here to help make sure I'm on the same page. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty, there's the word liberty again, wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The law of sin and death. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now we go back to where, describing what's going on. The liberty here is talking about circumcision of the flesh. Today it's the circumcision of the spirit. You want to be saved? You want to go to heaven? You want your sins washed away? You got to go through Jesus Christ. And people say, well, I'm, I, I like the law. I like standards and, and everything. And I, I kind of want to go through the law. There's no liberty in the law. All right. Verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. That's right. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. How far are we going? All the way to 12. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth. You know, people coming in trying to say you have to keep the law. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Remember we read about there, sin so, if I sin so against the brethren, I've sinned against Christ. Verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then it is the offense of the cross ceased. Now, yeah, the cross is okay, but, but you still need to be circumcised. Yeah, the cross is okay, but you still need to keep the Sabbath. You know, you still need to only eat certain meats. Verse 12. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. There's our word liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. 13. Yep, we stopped at uh, 13. But notice there, that last one. For, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Okay, we're free from the law of sin and death. But does that, does that mean we can just sin all we want? Although use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Right? People like to grab liberty and try to hold on to it and justify sin. There's people out there that do that. Paul knew that was going to happen. God, through Paul, knew people were going to misuse liberty. So that's why God has shown us that we do have liberty. But there's ways we can misuse that liberty. We saw one up there when it came to circumcision, where at one point he had to get circumcision if he wanted to reach the people he was preaching the gospel to. There's times where you can't only eat certain foods when you're trying to preach the gospel to certain people. Okay? Just because you have liberty doesn't mean you should do it. Uh -huh. And just because you have liberty doesn't mean you don't do it. I have the right, I'm not going to do it. Like we saw with the circumcision. Okay? But I want to get into the top part real quick. It says, Stand fast therefore in liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Okay? Matthew 22, 14. We're getting long here in the video. For many are called, but few are chosen. I just want to throw that out there. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world 
to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. There's the glory part again. Right? Uh, the Jews, they, they, the lost Jews out there, they still try to keep the law and everything, and we're despised by them. Okay? We try to preach Jesus to them. We try to preach that Jesus paid the final, you know, he overcame the law of sin and death. He paid for your sins. There's no more uh, uh, sacrifice, uh, atonements, blood atonements, the old animal sacrifices. It's no longer you keep the law to be saved. Okay? But we're despised by them. Verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. There we get back to where it says we're not to use liberty as occasion to the flesh. We're redeemed. Sanctification. Okay? That according as written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Everything we do is to glorify God. When you're lost, it's 100% about your flesh. When you get saved, it's 100% about Jesus Christ. Giving him glory in all things. Giving him thanks in all things. The Bible says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. It's about keeping God's words. Because you love Jesus Christ, it's all about Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, not, use not liberty for occasion to the flesh. Romans 6.1. We'll go ahead and turn to that one real quick. Romans 6.1. Let me you know where I'm going. I've already mentioned it a little bit. What's it talking about here when it says, um, Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. We're still supposed to... Do our best to obey God's word. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. I understand that. But we're supposed to have the attitude of, I don't want that. I don't want to sin against God. I want to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to study to show myself approved. Okay? I'm going to do my best to obey the word of God. I'm going to try to do everything in my life. I'm going to go down the whole checklist. All the things I do in my life. Every day. Give God thanks for everything. Give him glory for everything. Do everything that's in my power. Do everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? Liberty is not used as an occasion for the flesh. Okay? Because flesh loves to be under certain laws. Because if you're under the law... As long as you obeyed that law, I can sin all I want. I, when it comes to the blood atonement, I can go in, do my animal sacrifice, and then I can go back to sin again. I can always just come back the next week and do another animal sacrifice. Okay? We're not supposed to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh like they did in the Old Testament. Okay? They, and that, remember, the Old law, I got the Old Testament law, there's no liberty, but you don't understand what I'm saying? They... There's people misusing it. I'll just give a sacrifice this week and then I can sin all I want. Just do another next sac sacrifice next week. There's people doing the same thing today. Okay, They're trying to say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. And they just look like the world, act like the world, live in wicked sin. And then they keep coming back to us saying, who are you to judge me? God's grace is what saved me. Are we to sin that God's... What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that God grace may abound? Uh, no, you're not gonna. Your attitude is gonna change after salvation. You're not gonna want to sin anymore. Okay. And we're gonna. Okay. So why did I name this video "Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death"? As we saw, and the main ones that they try to use to justify sin when it comes to not giving God glory, doing something that doesn't give God glory, it's sin. I'm sorry. It's what the Bible commands. You're to give God glory in everything. It's a command. You don't do it. If you're doing something that doesn't give God glory in it and God shows you, hey, you can't give God glory in that, you're to quit it. There's things that there at one time you could give God glory in it. And I don't want to get into like this big thing, but something that you start doing too much where it becomes an addiction. You have liberty. That's the Old Testament. But there's things you can do that you give God glory in. My garden. I can do my garden 
and spend, I don't know, like two hours a day out there doing the garden because I have a small garden. But I can go crazy and do the whole hillside. I got five acres and just do garden, garden and spend all my day gardening. And I don't read the Bible as much as I used to. I don't pray as much as I used to. I don't give God thanks as much as I used to. It's no longer about glorifying God and everything that I do. It's only about, I got to do my gardening because I love my garden. It can become an addiction where you can't glorify God in it. But here's the question, does liberty have anything to do with that? No. Why? Because there's not an Old Testament law saying, commanding you to be a gardener and you have to garden 10 hours a day. There's no Old Testament law that says that. There's no, testament, no uh, Old Testament law saying you can't do it. Liberty has to do with the Old Testament laws. There's laws you can choose to follow. There's laws you can choose not to follow. You want to keep the Sabbath day? That's an Old Testament law. Go for it. If you don't, fine. You have liberty. That's what liberty's talking about. And liberty has to do with the salvation issue. When they try to pull you back under the law and say you have to obey the uh, Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, they're crin that's when they're affecting your liberty. They're trying to steal your liberty and bring you back under bondage. It's no longer Jesus' blood. It, it's no longer it is finished. It's about you got to do good works to be saved. Mm -hmm. That's what liberty is talking about. And remember, just recapping real quick. You can, liberty can offend people. Two types of offense. People that want to control you, you can offend them when you say, no, I have liberty. And you can offend people like brothers and sisters in Christ, calling them, causing them to stumble and fall into sin. Uh, you can cause the lost world, offend the lost world in the sense of you close doors for witnessing. Right? Because it might be a salva uh, liberty issue, not salvation, liberty issue, but you can win people to Christ by make, with your conscience by making certain choices. Even though you have liberty, you can do it, you choose not to, so you can win that person to Christ. You choose not to, so you don't make that brother or sister in Christ stumble. Right? Uh, but we're going to end with Galatians 5.14. If you want to turn to Galatians 5.14. Remember, give me liberty or give me death. I'll take liberty. Okay? I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not the Old Testament law. Not keeping law. I'm not saved by good works. Okay? If you want to misuse uh, liberty, then what you're saying is, is you want to give me death. The law of sin and death. Okay? Now, for the brethren out there that I believe are saved and misusing it, it has nothing to do with video games, movies, TV shows. It has nothing to do with, I want to wear blue shirts. You, I think I said red earlier, but I want to wear blue shirts. You want to wear red shirts. We have liberty. That has nothing to do with it. Okay? It has to be an Old Testament law that's written saying you have to do something or you can't do something. And today, we now have liberty. Okay? We can choose to do it or not to do it. That's what the liberty is talking about in all these pa passages that I've been bringing up that the lost world uses and brothers and sisters in Christ have fallen into the trap of using to justify sin, to justify things that don't give God glory. Okay. Um, Galatians 15, 14, or 5, 14, sorry, 5, 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the capital S spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, capital S, and the capital S spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. We're no longer under the law of sin and death. We're free from it. Remember what uh, Paul said about, he talked about the struggle with the flesh and he thanks God that with his mind he may serve the law of God and with the flesh the law of sin. And remember what we talked about, the word death isn't there. So you're not serving the law of sin and death as a Christian. You're still the law of sin, the sinful nature, the flesh that you have to deal with every day. But you have the Holy Spirit in here and in here. Okay. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, 
heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, before we keep going, stop there. Remember the law, uh, the Old Testament law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. If you're under the works of the flesh to be saved, that's what it's all about. Nobody can keep the law. Okay? Now, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's a good word. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. We've been talking about glory. Vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay? I thought that was perfect to sum up everything we've been talking about when it comes to liberty, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Walk after the capital S Spirit, not after the flesh. Okay. Do not provoke one another, envying one another. Okay. Do your best to serve brothers and sisters from Christ, and you don't serve them by trying to hide behind liberty and justifying sins, addictions. Uh, justify your choice of doing something that's not a sin, it's liberty, but it doesn't edify the body of Christ. It doesn't help you witness. It hinders your ability to witness. It hurts brothers and sisters in Christ, even though you have liberty. We're supposed to serve one another. Okay? So make sure that when you're saying, I want liberty, it's not give, give me liberty or give me death. Either God's liberty works, Jesus Christ fully, completely paid for it on the cross, and it works, and I'm going to heaven. Or just give me the law of sin and death, I'm going to hell. That's your two choices. Jesus Christ or the Old Testament. Death, burial, and resurrection, the blood that was shed, or you're under the works of the flesh. That's your two choices. That's what liberty is talking about. You're getting free from the law of sin and death. Right? Don't misuse liberty. Right? Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. See you in the next study.